Mr. Todd, what do you plan to do about the bugs in Starfield? All of this just works. <laughs> 16 times the detail. I agree with that. What do you plan to do about the loading screens? All of this just works. So we're interested in all the little details like this plant here, all the way up to distant mountains. And if you've played our previous stuff, you know that mountain is not just a backdrop. You can walk all the way to the top of that mountain. You see that mountain? That's where it all started. Starfield should have been amazing. It was supposed to be Todd Howard's masterpiece, the game that defines next generation, highly ambitious and their biggest one yet. Bethesda hyped this game like crazy with the trailers, gameplay demos, interviews and finally the deep dive. It was looking like the game of our dreams, the ultimate space exploration game. Everything was looking very promising. Until the game actually released. If you go on the internet and check the reviews of this game, you will find mostly two types of people. Some that believe that this is the best game of the generation, 10 out of 10 masterpiece, Todd Howard's magnum opus. And then there are some that believe that this is the biggest piece of dog shit they've ever played, their disappointment is immeasurable, and their day is ruined. And I am not either of those. You see, I've been a Bethesda fan since Skyrim. I have played Fallout 3, Fallout 4, Skyrim, Fallout New Vegas, which I know was made by Obsidian, but it had the same magic as any other Bethesda game. And I loved it. I never got a chance to play their older games because, well, back then I was really young and dumb. But from Fallout 3, I have played all of their other games and I love them all. No. Not, not you, not you. Can you please leave? Some games were really good and some were not as good, but I loved them regardless. I love exploring the open world, getting lost in it, and I had a lot of fun. So when they showed us that 45 minute long gameplay deep dive of Starfield with all those gameplay features, I was sold. And like any other Bethesda fan, I simply forgot the fact that Fallout 76 even existed and got hyped for Starfield. But you know what happens when you hype something up to the galaxy? It also creates really high expectations. And it's our biggest one yet. Over 1,000 planets all open for you to explore. Every button, every blinky light, not just on one terminal, on all of them. And we've done a lot, and tonight we are gonna show you a lot. It allows us to have 16 times the detail. That mountain is not just a backdrop. You can walk all the way to the top of that mountain. All new rendering, lighting, and landscape technology. Features full physical-based rendering, as well as dynamic volumetric lighting. We realistically simulate the galaxy around you. Our next generation lighting model uses real-time global illumination. It is four times the size of Fallout 4 and even view distant weather systems across the map. And we know we have a responsibility to do this game right. When people got excited for Starfield, those were not empty excitements. Bethesda had a history of making really good open world games. With their Fallout series and the Elder Scrolls series, they proved that they can make really fun open world games. To this day, Skyrim has a huge player base. There is a huge modding community making this game better every day. And all of this is because people love playing their games. Take Rockstar Games for example. They have been making great games for years, from GTA 3 to GTA 4 to GTA 5, Red Dead Redemption, Red Dead Redemption 2. Every Rockstar game keeps getting better than their previous one in terms of graphic, gameplay, scale, quality quality and basically everything. So when they announced that they are going to give us the game that we all been waiting for, everyone got excited. Now of course I'm not comparing Bethesda with Rockstar because they both make very different kind of games. But the point remains the same. Both of these companies have a history of making really amazing games. Of course they might have made a few fuck ups here and there but when they say that they are gonna give us the game that we all been waiting for, whether it be GTA 6 or Starfield in case of Bethesda, getting hyped is natural and oh boy Todd made some hype over 1000 planets what the moon is not a backdrop I can go there really good looking foods aliens space traveling space combat space pirates sandwiches I can build my own ship what is that a platypus 
Perry the Platypus. And it got so many good ratings too. What? It must be an amazing game. In God of War 2018, Kratos said, Keep your expectations low, boy. And you will never be disappointed. Because when high expectations does not match the actual reality, people feel disappointed, angry, and betrayed. Big question from many. Why did you not optimize this game for PC? Uh, we did. It's running great. It is a next-gen PC game. We really do push the technology, so you may need to upgrade your PC for this game. And one of the great things about having a fully dynamic game engine is all of this just works. That isn't just a backdrop. That moon is actually there orbiting the planet. Yes, you can visit it too. It allows us to have 16 times the detail. We actually have recorded around a thousand of the most popular names for him to say. And again, it, it just works. You'll never even see a server when you play. It's not, I'm not kidding. The game has over 200 dungeons, all handcrafted. 100% dedicated servers. And I want to be clear, actually that feature is not coming out at launch. And that uh, sometimes, it doesn't just work. Todd Howard doesn't exactly lie. Well, mostly. What he actually does is twist the truth and sugarcoat it in such a way that even the shittiest thing sounds like an amazing product. Until you actually receive the product and realize that it's, it's pretty bad. And it's our biggest one yet. It is four times the size of Fallout 4. It allows us to have 16 times the detail. When Todd said 16 times the details, did anyone ask what does 16 times the detail actually mean? It's not like the game is running at 16 times higher resolution. It ran at the native resolution whatever the PlayStation or Xbox could handle. It's not even like it had 16 times more realistic graphic than their previous games because I cannot see much difference. I mean, it looks a bit better, but it's not 16 times better. So what does it even mean? The truth is, it does not even matter. Because when Todd said those famous words, people went crazy. Ooh, 16 times the details. Let's go, yeah. You see, Todd knows how to sell a pen. He knows how to hype something up and get audience excited. It's like those Wish.com memes where you order something good and receive a cheap looking product which does not look anything like the original product. And that's kind of what happened with Starfield. After launch, people started to see its true colors. Turns out, space exploration isn't actually real. You can't exactly do that. You have to fast travel everywhere. You can't directly land or take off from a planet. You have to always go to the map and see a cutscene. If you try to travel through space the way they showed us in the actual video, you have to go through at least five different loading screens to actually land on a planet. But the funny thing is, they cut out all those loading screens in that video. And remember the moon, which was not supposed to be a backdrop? Well, it turns out out, it was a backdrop and you can directly go there. I mean you can fast travel there but you cannot normally go there. The UI was really bad which the models fixed. The game was also not well optimized for PC and for some reason it did not have DLSS on launch which again the models fixed with a DLSS mod. The game had really bad performance on PC although it was not Bethesda's fault because my PC was not good enough and I needed to upgrade my PC for this game. Why did you not optimize this game for PC? Uh, we did. You may need to upgrade your PC for this game. What? I mean, can you believe Todd literally said to all the players to their face that their PC is not good enough, that you are poor, get rich and buy a better graphics card to play this game. What are you talking about? Just just download some RAM, bro. Just, just download some RAM. What are you talking about? The game was locked at 30 FPS for consoles, no 60 FPS mode, the game had lots of bugs, which I will get back to later in this video. The game was filled with fucking loading screens after loading screens and then more loading screens. The NPCs were brain dead and looked horrible with their weird eyes and facial expressions. There are hidden barriers in every planet, although it's not that big of a deal because planet exploration is really boring. And all of this was just the beginning. We haven't even gotten into the main game yet.
but the cry and nobody I heard a lot of people say that this game gets good after 5 hour mark or after 10 hour mark or after 15 hour mark that the game is slow paced and takes time to pick up and get interesting but here's the thing there's a difference in between being slow paced and being boring take persona 5 for example just the tutorial of that game is around 8 hours long where the game holds your hand and keeps telling you what to do, where to go, who to talk to, when to wake up, when to go to school, when to sleep. It is slow paced. But that does not mean it's actually boring. The game constantly keeps throwing new stuff at you to keep you engaged and also excited and entertained throughout the entire tutorial. Whoa, who is this guy? What's happening? Who is this guy and why he keeps saying for real? Are you for real? For real? For real? For real? Is that a palace? Is that a talking cat? What's happening? What is this abomination? What is that? Or take Red Dead Redemption 2 for example. The game is really slow paced, where a lot of your time will be spent just traveling on horse from point A to point B. But does it get boring? No, the game keeps giving you new stuff along the way that keeps you engaged all the time. And the story design is so good that those quiet moments also become a part of the main story. Or even take Bethesda's own game for example, like Skyrim. You wake up and you are on a card. Who are these people? They seem nice. Where are we going? What is actually happening? Oh no, they killed him! Oh no, they chopped his head off! Am I gonna die too? Is that a dragon? And then you're running for your life while the dragon is destroying everything. And now take Starfield for example. The game starts inside a mine where you are mining stuff. Then you come across this rock and when you touch it, you see this cutscene. And you will see this kind of cutscene so many times through the game, I'm telling you. Anyway, after that, you create your own character and get out. Fight some pirates and then this guy shows up and gives you his spaceship. Because, well, you touch the rock, which no one else could, I guess. And he gives you his watch, which he claims that it even tells the time. Take this. You'll find it very useful out there. And it even tells the time. But that was a fucking lie because you can't actually see the time. You can see the graph of the current planet but that's pretty much it. You have to guess the time, you cannot exactly see it. After that you take the ship and go to space and then do some space combat where the game teaches you how space combat works basically and then the game tells you to go to this planet. And the funny thing is I didn't knew that you have to actually fast travel there. So I kept boosting my ship towards the planet hoping I will reach there eventually. And I kept doing that for a while until I actually finally realized that I cannot do that. My ship was basically stuck in one place and movement didn't actually matter at all. Why are we still here? Just to suffer. Anyway, you fast travel to the planet, kill some more enemies. The fucking hitbox! Then finally go to the constellation in New Atlantis and give them the piece of rock that you found. The artifact. If you could place it on the table here. Yeah, I'm gonna pass on that. Thanks for the offer though. Apparently they are collecting those rocks for um, reasons. And then they ask you to join their team and help them find all the other rock pieces that are scattered in the universe. And that's it. That's basically the main story. Gathering rocks. Along the story you will meet the British girl, the chill guy, the rich guy, the cowboy guy and his daughter, the guy that will help you find space magic, the religious girl who does not like anything fun you do. This too, I don't, I don't know their actual role, explore thousand planets. If you are strong enough, find space temples, use space magic, run out of storage and suffer. 
Look at confusing UI and suffer. Stop robbery. Stop pirates. Become pirates. Flirt with your companions. Pursue people. Manipulate people. Follow people who walk really slowly. I mean really, really slowly. So slowly that you want to end your own life. Install Elon Musk's chip inside your head. Go to space stations. Go to future city. Go to the cowboy city. Go to the confusing as fox city. Like really, to this day, I have no idea where anything is in New Atlantis. If you drop me at a random place in the city and ask me to find something, I will be fucking lost. I mean there is not even a mini map of the actual place. I mean what the fuck is this? What am I supposed to see here? Who approved this? Most of the main story is basically one fetch quest after another. Where do you go to random places, kill some random enemies, pursue some NPCs, talk to some more NPCs, get the rock and bring it back. That's pretty much most of the main story. I mean sure, the game tries to do this quest little differently here and there, but that does not exactly work, and after a while it gets really repetitive. In between this fetch quest, sometimes you do actually get a few interesting quests. For example, somewhere in the middle of the main quest line, there's a mission where your team gets divided into two parts, right? One side is on the space and one is on the planet. And one of the member from one of these teams is going to die. And the game creates a situation where it forces you to save one side. One member of whichever side you did not save is going to die. And it's going to be the member that you are most connected to. And this mission broke me. This mission made me so sad. I was really thinking which side to save because I love them all. And I was really struggling on who should I save. I wish I could say that, but that was not the case. You see, I didn't care about any of them at all. I didn't care who survives or who dies because the game didn't do a good enough job for me to feel connected to them. These characters don't have any characteristics in them. They are really shallow, boring and doesn't feel important enough. These characters don't have enough development for me to actually feel about them. I mean, I don't even know who these two people are and what they do. Who the are you? Who you is? If you compare this to some other game like The Last of Us, which is one of my most favorite games of all time, and again, spoilers for The Last of Us, the game does a really good job in terms of character development. Throughout the game, I really care about these characters and their relationship. And halfway through the game, when Joel gets hurt, and now I am suddenly playing as Ellie, I was genuinely sad and scared that Joel might have died. And when I found out that he was alive, I was extremely happy. Because I cared about them, the game did a great job in making me feel for them. Or if we talk about Red Dead Redemption 2 for example, again spoilers, as we kept playing the story, we see Arthur slowly dying, he gets weaker, slower and even though he did so many bad things, when he dies, the only thing I felt was sadness. And it's not even about how long you have spent with these characters. If we go back to The Last of Us again, within the first 30 minutes of the game, Joel's daughter Sarah dies. And even though she was on screen for less than 30 minutes, her death leaves a huge impact. And it's because of how the game was designed. From the start of the game, you play as Sarah. You see everything from her point of view. You see how she is scared, how she is hopeless, and you start to feel connected to her. And that's why when she dies, it hurts. And of course, the actors also did an amazing job, and all of this together made this scene really impactful. But when I see Starfield, I don't feel anything for these characters, because the game did not do a good enough job in terms of character development. They had a really good idea, the concept was really nice. They tried to do something really interesting, and if they would have done it right, this quest could have left a huge impact on most of the players. But because they didn't spend much time in terms of character development, the quest didn't have any huge impact. They had a really good idea, but the execution was just not good enough. Another mission that felt really interesting to me was around a late game area, where you have to go and collect another piece of those artifacts. And at this point, I knew the drill. Go to a location, kill some enemies, talk to some people, get the artifact and get back. I knew what to expect because I have done this type of quest multiple times before this. But when I went there and started following this random NPC, because I had to, the entire environment around me suddenly changed. And I was genuinely shocked and I was like what the fuck just happened? 
for a game that throws you a loading screen on any chance it gets suddenly changed the entire environment within a second. No loading screens whatsoever. And I was genuinely shocked and got extremely curious about the quest. So turns out there are two different realities that were overlapping each other and existing in the same place. And there are different people living in each reality. And you have to jump between these realities to get that actual artifact. And by the end of the quest, you have to make a huge decision on which reality you want to save. Because whichever you don't save, everyone in that reality would die. It seemed like such a good concept and got really interesting. But the quest was again ruined by really bad execution because whoever designed this quest made it so confusing. I was running around for more than 30 minutes trying to figure out where the fuck am I supposed to even go? I kept jumping between realities trying to go near the marker but couldn't find a fucking way. And on top of that, there is no minimap to guide you. Why isn't there a minimap? Who approved this? I was so confused that I checked YouTube for help. And turns out, it was not only me that hated this level. There were so many people who faced the same issue. And by the time I finished this level, I was exhausted and thanking God that this mission finally ended. Again, this could have been a really good quest. It had a really good concept and a really interesting story, but it was ruined for poor execution. There are also these missions where you have to visit space temples to get space magic powers. These are also extremely repetitive. You basically have to go to a particular planet, wherever the game tells you to go. Then you have to find a temple. You have to go inside the temple. You have to fly around and catch lights. And there will be a spinning disc which will eventually stop and then you have to go inside the disc and you will get the power. And you have to do this over and over and over and over and over and over again. You have to do this so many times that it will get extremely repetitive. And the funny thing is you don't even need to collect all of them to finish the actual main storyline. The final few missions of the main quest were also not good enough. Those were also some type of fetch quests. Even the final mission was kind of a fetch quest where you have to go and collect another artifact. The final boss fight didn't even felt like a boss fight. And at the end, I kid you not, you can literally pursue one of those starborns to give up all of their artifacts. I mean, why didn't we do that in the first place? What was the point of all of this fighting and running around when we could have just pursued one of them and got the thing we wanted that easily? And finally, at the very end of your main quest line, you will end up in this Unity place. And if you move forward, you will end up in New Game Plus. You will lose all your stuff, but keep all your abilities. Again, this concept seemed really nice, where there is a multiverse and you can go to alternate universes and restart again. Finishing the story will put you in New Game Plus, and the main story is basically a loop that keeps happening over and over again with slight variations every time. But at this point, we have seen quite a few multiverse movies. So all of this feels just another multiverse story, and it's not even a good one. And don't get me wrong, on paper, it seems like a really good concept. But in practicality, I am not going to give up everything just to start New Game Plus. And I am in no mood to play this main quest all over again. But hey, it's not just the main story that makes a Bethesda game special. I mean, there are so many other side content to do, exploring the world and doing side quests. That's what makes a Bethesda game special. And this game must have a lot of fun side content to do, right? Right? Once we get out of the vault, what do we do? Whatever you want. There are lots of different towns you can visit, quests you can do, and the story we have, I think it's, I think it's the best one we've ever done. Story gives you context and propels you through those loops. How do we tell a good story while maintaining a big open world where you can do what you want? This is the golden age of gaming. The game becomes its own thing for each individual player, and that's important to us. And we actually got to the point where you could have two conversations at once. You could give this guy an answer, move away and give that guy an Some answer. More Great games are played, not made. Be who you want, exploring a huge world, doing quests, experiencing a story and leveling up. Our hearts are really in single player and that's what we want to focus on and yeah. make it the best it can be. Now can you honestly play Skyrim forever? I mean you could, you'll probably get bored eventually and then want to play something else, but you can play it for a really long time.
Starfield has a lot of side content that you can do, but the most interesting ones are the factions quest lines. There are a total of 4 main factions and you can complete all of them in a single playthrough. Some of them are really good, and then there's some that are not as good. I'm looking at you Ryujin. But I can tell you this, that most of these quest lines are way better than the actual main story. Let's go through these quest lines one by one and I'm going to give you a really compact and super duper short summary of each quest lines as we progress. So here it goes. Let's start with the one that I love the most, UC Vanguard quest line. So the story is something like this. There are these Terramorph creatures and they are extremely deadly and have mind control abilities. They have lots and lots of health and a really dumb AI. I mean seriously, when I was fighting a Terramorph for the first time, I was inside a room and there was some kind of box in the center of the room and the AI was so dumb, it could not jump over the box to attack me. So it just kept running in circles until I eventually killed it. I just realized it cannot exactly jump. It cannot jump over this the cabinet thingy. Uh, if I just keep if I just keep moving, it cannot catch me ever. It's just gonna keep rotating. It's just gonna take a while though. But the AI. But anyway, nobody knows where these terramorphs are coming from. And as I said, they are extremely deadly and can wipe out the entire mankind. So you jump into this rabbit hole trying to figure out what is actually going on and, and try to solve this mystery. And you also try to figure out who is behind all these terramorph attacks. That's basically the story of this questline. Along the way, you will meet this guy who is supposed to be dead, but is not actually dead. Clearly, he tells you that he can help you but you have to kill someone for him. So you do that and then he gives you some information. And once you follow up on those informations, eventually you will figure out what's actually going on. Turns out there are these things called heat leeches. And those gets mutated into terramorphs once they come in contact with certain pollen. And eventually you will also find out that this guy was behind all of these attacks all along. And by the end of the quest, you have to make a decision on how you want to deal with these terramorphs. You can bring in a new species that will naturally keep the balance of the terramorphs or use microbe to get rid of these terramorphs once and for all. Overall, it was a really good storyline. Keep in mind, I just give you an extremely short summary of this quest line. There is a lot that happens in this story that I haven't even talked about. But overall, it was a really good quest line. I was really interested in the story and I really enjoyed it. In second place, I would put the Crimson Fleet quest line. Mainly because I really wanted to be a space pirate in this game and this quest line lets you do that. Kinda. You start the quest by becoming an agent for the UC Sysdev and join the Crimson Fleet as an undercover agent. Throughout the quest line, you are trying to find this huge treasure that is hidden somewhere in the space and you are going through different places trying to find out where this treasure actually could be. And while you are doing all of this, you are also giving all the intel and data back to the UC Sysdev. You are reporting everything you are doing with the Crimson Fleet back to the UC. After going to a bunch of places, talking to a bunch of people and killing a bunch of stuff, you will eventually find this treasure. Turns out it's in this spaceship that's surrounded by an electromagnetic field that destroys other spaceships, but for some reason not this one. And by the end of the quest, you have to make a decision on which side you want to be on. You can be on the side of UC or the fleet. I joined the Crimson Fleet because I wanted to be a pirate. And then there will be a huge battle where you have to fight a bunch of spaceships where I died a lot and finally the quest will end. I also loved this quest line mainly because I just wanted to be a pirate and do bad stuff honestly. In third rank, I will put the Freestar Collective quest line. This quest goes something like this. In Aquila City, you stop a robbery. After that, you can join the Freestar Rangers, right? Now there are these people called the First who are trying to buy farmers' lands. And they are threatening those who are not selling those lands. And you are trying to figure out what the fuck is actually going on. Along the way, you will meet this guy who seems really shady. One of his ship gets stolen or something, I don't know. And you are trying to figure out who stole it. The entire quest line is basically running to random places, following random NPCs at a really slow pace and then talking to those NPCs and repeating this process over and over and over again until you finally finish the quest line. At the end of the quest line, you will meet this guy and you have to kill him and then he will just come back to life like nothing happened and here you will learn that this guy from earlier is the mastermind behind all of this. He's the guy who's been taking over farmer's land all along. 
And at the end of the quest line, you get a choice to take a bribe from this guy and let him go or just take him in. Honestly, I didn't like this quest that much, mainly because it just got really boring and the story was also not that interesting. Although by the end of the quest, you do get a really cool looking ship, so that's a great thing. But other than that, this quest line was not as much fun as the other ones. And finally, in last place, I would put the Ryujin Industries questline. The thing about this questline is that it has a decent story where you are trying to climb this corporate ladder, doing shady stuff, planting fake evidence and trying to take down your competitors. But the problem is the execution again is really bad. Most of the missions are boring stealth based missions and in most of these missions all you have to do is go somewhere steal something and bring it back or go somewhere plant a fake evidence and put some virus in someone's computer or whatever and come back. These missions get really boring and on top of that you have to come back every time after doing a particular mission. Like why can't I just use some kind of communication system to tell them that hey Remember the virus you asked me to put in this computer? Well, I did it. Can you like send me the money and info for my next mission so that I don't have to keep traveling to your planet and go through bunch of loading screens and I could just, you know, directly go to the mission spot? No, all of these just works. This constant back and forth between planets get really time consuming. And with all of this, it kind of ruins the quest. Although one thing that I love about this faction is that by the end of the quest line, you get a mind controlling ability. So that is a really cool thing. But other than that, it was not that much fun. The entire quest line was really boring and not fun at all. Now here's the thing, I just give you a super duper small summary of these quest lines. There are a lot more stuff that happens in these quest lines that I haven't even talked about. But I can tell you this, that these faction quest lines were a lot better than the actual main quest of this game. Now other than factions, Starfield also has a lot of other side quests and there are quite a few side quests that are really good and have a really interesting story. But most of the side quests that you will find on those thousands of empty planets are mostly procedurally generated and kind of boring. The good side quests can only be found on the settlement areas like the big cities like New Atlantis, Aquila, Neon, etc etc. You will find a lot of quests with really interesting stories which I really liked but other than that most of the side quests that you will find on those empty planets are just not worth it with starfield we've completely overhauled our combat so whatever you have in your hands or whatever you're using you're going to get better at and then you're going to level up it's more dynamic the animations are more fluid uh, that stands for the vault tech assisted targeting system so it allows you to pause time and queue up moves the right trigger does your right hand and the left trigger does your left hand you can also choose to go hands-on with melee weapons. Or you can use VATS, which now gives you more control to slow down time and choose your shots. To ship combat, it's not about just hitting your triggers to fire your weapons. It's a complex dance between your piloting skills and our power allocation system. You can play in real time, or you can press the right bumper and use VATS, the Vault Tech Assisted Targeting System. We probably have more mods and more weapons in this game than I want to say any other game we've done before. We love those things about our games too it would not have it any other way Story is not always the thing that makes a game amazing. I mean there are a lot of games that does not have a good story but amazing gameplay. There are some games that has amazing story but not as good gameplay. Some games have both great gameplay and story. Some games have really amazing gameplay but the story is hidden in the item descriptions. And then there is Starfield. Starfield's combat is barely average, like it's hanging on the line between average and below average. Starfield's combat can be divided into two sections, there is space combat and then there is ground combat. Space combat in Starfield is not the best, it gets the job done but it's not exactly much fun. Space combat in Starfield is not skill based but it's more about how strong your ship actually is. 
because when five or six enemy ships start shooting at you all at once, the only thing you can do is hope that your ship has enough HP to survive all those attacks. And then you start attacking all those ships one by one until all of them eventually get destroyed. There's nothing much about skill here because if you have a low level ship, you will die. A lot. And to bypass this problem, people started to make this type of ships because turns out enemy ships always target the center of your ship. So if your ship does not have a center, the bullets will always go through the center and miss. Now of course you have the option to make space combat a bit better and a bit more complex with these skills, where you get more control on your ship and combat. But here's the thing, these abilities are locked behind skill points. You need to invest a lot of skill points if you really want to get better at ship combat. And investing so many points in just space combat seems kinda useless because there are so many other skills where you should be putting your points. Maybe in late game when you have a lot of spare skills, then yes you can put those here but especially in early game without these points, space combat will suck. There is also a ship control panel where you can allocate a limited amount of power between different parts of the ship. But it also never felt that much useful. First of all, even if you have one point in grav drive, that's pretty much enough to teleport, it just takes a bit longer. And I always had my shield at max, because I needed to survive the fight. And whatever point I had left, I just spread them among attack and engine. So it was very rare for me to switch up points, because everything was working just fine. All of this just works. But whenever I did have to change those points, especially in combat, it got extremely annoying because it's really hard to switch up points while you are fighting multiple ships and all of them are shooting at you at the same time. The concept was really good to switch up power in between combat, making decisions on the go, making decisions on what's important. It seemed like a really good idea, but the final execution was just not good enough. But hey, that was just space combat. Now let's talk about ground combat. The game has a huge amount of really cool looking guns. A lot of them has this NASA punk aesthetic, which I guess what Bethesda was going for, and they look really good. But the biggest problem with gun combat is it does not feel good. Firing a gun feels really clunky and really unsatisfying. It feels like you are firing a BB gun or one of those Nerf guns. And the sound these guns make are even worse. The sound design of these guns are not good at all. Most of the time, it feels like you're firing with toy guns. And even though you have such a huge variety of guns, none of the guns are actually special. None of them have any unique ability that makes them different from the other guns. So what I always ended up doing was just using the gun that has the highest amount of DPS. Because every time I went into a fight, all I tried to do is finish the fight as soon as possible. Because all of the enemies in this game are huge bullet sponges. And I kid you not, they will consume your bullets like a black hole. I read online that some people were asking why there is no black hole in Starfield. But there are black holes inside every single enemy. They have so much health that you will keep shooting them until you run out of your bullets. And why the fuck this guy has 3 health bars? What's so special about him? He's the same level as I am but I don't have 3 health bars. And it's not even like he's wearing any special armor. He's wearing the same thing as the other enemies. Why does having high level means you have now 3 health bars? It does not make any sense. He is still some random dude wearing a random armor. So why does he have 3 health bars? What's the actual lore behind this? It just does not make any sense. And on top of all this, the enemy AI is fucking brain dead. They will stand in one place and keep taking bullets until they actually die. And there's nothing fun in fighting these enemies, it's just extremely boring and all of this just ruins the fun of the combat. And I haven't even talked about melee combat yet. It feels like they added melee weapons in the game just to tick the box of melee combat. Melee combat in this game feels extremely unsatisfying and the hitbox of melee weapons are all over the place. There was so many times I was hitting an enemy and the weapon was just phasing through the enemy. It was not registering the hit. It felt like they added melee combat at the very last minute. Like someone called Todd and said, Hey Todd, shouldn't we add some kind of melee combat so that if the players run out of ammo they could use a melee weapon or something? We will add that at last minute. Work on thousand planets first. But Todd, if we do that, will that actually work? Ha ha ha, 
That's the thing, it always works. All of this just works. And most of these problems can be fixed by just making the enemy AI better and making them less bullet spongy. And again, models have already made a mod that fixes this bullet sponge problem. It just sucks that Bethesda didn't do it in the first place. But hey, so what the combat is not good. Bethesda games are also known for their really good open world exploration. And this game has like a total of 1000 planets to explore. The exploration in this game must be really good, right? Right? And interesting to go and explore because a big part of our games is personal discovery. What do you find over the next hill? What's going to be in this building? And not just this system, but over a hundred systems over 1,000 planets all open for you to explore. You can create any kind of character you want and then go do what you want. This is an enormous dynamic world where you can create any kind of character you want, go where you want, and do whatever you want. Be who you want and go do what you want. Player freedom remains our absolute number one goal. That there's a ton there for everybody to do. Because even though someone might play the game for 20 hours instead of 300, we, we want that to be unique and it's our biggest one yet. It is four times the size of Fallout 4. That mountain is not just a backdrop. You can walk all the way to the top of that mountain. They can transport you to new worlds. They can give you the true wonder of discovery. You'll be who you want, exploring a huge world, doing quests, experiencing a story, and leveling up. Bethesda games are known for their open world exploration. They create these huge open worlds and give you total freedom to go wherever you want and do whatever you want. An open world where you can get lost, exploring and having fun. I wish I could say the same for Starfield. Even though Starfield gives you more than a thousand planets to explore, exploring most of them does not feel fun or worthwhile. Planets are mostly empty and boring. Yes, you do get some points of interest after landing on a planet, and at first, doing them is kind of fun. But after a while, it gets extremely repetitive, because the game keeps giving you the same kind of things over and over again. You will get some research stations, or caves, or enemy outposts, or some random ship landing. It's the same thing over and over again across all the planets. You will also get some random NPC encounters sometimes, where they give you some random fetch quest, but those are also really boring. The only good side quests that you can find are on the settlement areas. Other than that, every side quest you find on those random planets are procedurally generated and not fun. And exploration gets even more painful because you have to run to all those points of interest because those are really far away from each other and you can't directly land on those places. And the game does not have any vehicle system. A game which takes place so many years in the future does not have some kind of vehicle to explore the planets. It just does not even make any sense. Do you know why they didn't add any vehicles? I think it's because without the vehicles, you have to run everywhere, which is slow. So first of all, it will increase your playtime, but also it will take you a really long time to reach the edge of the planet maps. But if you have a vehicle, you will reach the edge of the planet very quickly and it will ruin the immersion, which Bethesda didn't want it. So they were like, let's just not add any vehicles. Or maybe they were just lazy, I don't know. Because I refuse to believe that this game cannot handle vehicles. Even their older games had some kind of transportation system. And you're telling me this game suddenly does not have any vehicles? It just does not make any sense. Wide as an ocean, deep as a puddle. Endless as the desert, shallow as a footprint. Boundless as a library, shallow as a pamphlet. Expansive as a canvas, shallow as a doodle. These are some of the words I can use to describe the exploration of Starfield. Starfield focuses more on quantity than actual quality. It's like the game gives you thousand Lamborghinis, but all of them are empty from inside, no engine, no seats or anything. And I would rather take one perfectly working Lamborghini and do gold digger pranks with it than just take thousand non-working empty ones, which are kinda useless. When you leave a planet and head into space, You'll be navigating asteroid fields, having chance meetings with interesting strangers, dogfighting in space, and exploring derelict ships.
It's all out there. Space exploration, the one thing that was supposed to make this game special, is not even real. The entire space exploration system is a lie. You cannot directly land or take off from a planet like No Man's Sky. You cannot even explore the space with your spaceship. No matter how much you boost your ship, you won't be able to reach another planet. The only way to travel is through the menu and fast traveling. It's like Fallout but the map is cut into multiple pieces and the only way to travel from one point to another is fast traveling. And all of this gets even worse because of the huge amount of loading screens that this game has. To do even the smallest of the smallest thing, you have to go through a loading screen. You want to go inside an elevator? Loading screen. You want to go inside a shop? loading screen. You want to go to a different location of the city? Boom! Loading screen. Let me give you an example. Let's say you want to travel from one planet to another. Guess how many loading screens you have to go through? First you need to get inside the ship. Loading screen. Sit on the cockpit. Cutscene. Take off your ship. Another cutscene. Then another loading screen. Now you are in space. Now select the planet where you want to go by opening the map. Now another cutscene. Then another loading screen. Now open the map again and select a location to land. Another loading screen followed by another cutscene. Then you get out of the cockpit. Another cutscene. Then you get out of the ship. Another loading screen. And now finally you are ready to explore the new planet. You have to go through 5 different loading screens and 5 cutscenes just to travel between 2 planets. Now I know what you are thinking. Why am I going through all these steps when I could just open the map and directly travel there with just one loading screen? What's the point of going through all these time wasting steps? Well because that's how Bethesda expects us to play the game. Remember the deep dive? This is how they showed us what space exploration is going to be. We will get into the ship, explore the space, grab jump toward planets and land wherever we wanted. It looked extremely fun and immersive. Except they did not show us any loading screens. They cut out all the loading screens from the video. So now when we try to do the same thing, we have to sit through bunch of cutscenes and loading screens which are really time consuming. And it's much better to just directly fast travel even though it's not immersive at all. Even games from last gen had way less loading screens than this. Games that ran on hard disks like God of War or Red Dead Redemption 2 figured out different ways to hide loading screens to make the game more immersive. And if we talk about current gen, Spider-Man 2's fast travel doesn't even have a loading screen. Starfield runs on SSD and still couldn't figure out a way to reduce loading screens. For a game that claims that it's next gen, Playing it feels like it's still stuck in that PlayStation 3 era with this many loading screens. And if all of this was not bad enough, we have the next big thing that Bethesda game is known for. Bugs. When Starfield launched, a lot of people said that this game has way less bugs than their previous games. But I didn't realize that they were comparing Starfield with Fallout 76. And yes, if you compare Starfield's bugs with Fallout 76, then Starfield does actually have way less bugs than what Fallout 76 had on launch. But that's not a game you should be comparing Starfield to. In my playthrough, I have faced a lot of bugs and glitches. Some that are funny, some that are really annoying, and some that actually breaks the game quests. A lot of the time NPCs will stand in depots, enemies would just stop firing, NPCs would clip through wall, switching into FPP mode would just vanish my shadow for some reason, talking to moving NPCs would glitch the camera, and whatever the fuck this is. There was this one time my entire screen was focal blurred for some reason and everything was really blurry. Companions would just stand in one position and stop fighting with the enemies. She's just fucking standing there. <laughs> Use a gun. These NPCs are not scripted. Of course you're not gonna last much longer. Use your fucking gun. Of course. What the fuck, bro? 
NPCs would just not spawn where they are supposed to. For example, there is a quest in early game where you have to go to Aquila city with Sam to meet his father. And the plan is Sam would distract his father while you try to steal something. But in my case, Sam never spawned. So his father was talking to thin air and I could not progress the quest. So I tried hitting his father in hopes that it might do something. And guess what happens? Sam suddenly spawns at the door and he starts shooting his own father because the AI registered him as a hostile enemy. And then they just started fighting and shooting each other. Hey, yo, bro, Disrespect. who are you talking to? to what are you talking to right now? There's nobody. Who are you talking to right now? Who do you think you're talking to right now? You... Sam has not spawned here, bro. What happens if I hit him? Say your prayers, pal. Wait, what? Hey, wh what? Where did you come from, dude? That's your father. You're shooting your fucking father. He's shooting his own father. This feels like old times. <laughs> what do you mean by old times? That's your father, dude. There was also this another time I got a quest to talk to Andreja, but no matter how many times I would press talk, she wouldn't even start a conversation. So her entire quest line was stuck. And also I could not share her inventory with me because she wouldn't even start a conversation. This kind of bugs just makes the game really annoying. And these were just the bugs that I faced. If you check the internet, you will find countless annoying bugs. There was this one bug where your game won't even boot, one where the game won't save your progress, another bug where fast traveling gets disabled indefinitely, another one where your ship gets despawned and you're just stuck on a planet. And these are just a few examples. The point is, there were a lot of bugs. And it was so bad that anytime I would get stuck somewhere, the first thing I would think of is that maybe this is a bug. And it was ruining the gaming experience. And with all these bugs and glitches, poor exploration, countless loading screens, bad NPC AI, all of this was ruining that one thing that makes a Bethesda game really special. Immersion. It's a game where you can do a million things, so there's a million things we could do more of, or there's a million things we could add, where you can create any kind of character you want, go where you want, and do whatever you want. Where the choices are yours, where you'll decide what happens. You'll decide the heroes, and you'll decide the villains. What are you going to sacrifice to survive? Are you going to be a good person, or are you going to be a bad person? And then, what about the different people you run into? And feel great no matter how you played it. You want to play it full on first person? You can play it in third person. To bring a virtual fantasy world to life. It's the player control the loop. Maybe he's playing around, he wants to learn. Maybe he wants to go here. Maybe he wants to do that. We give the player a lot of credit. We trust him. He wants downtime, he goes to town and talks to people. Says he wants a challenge, I'm gonna go fight that dragon I heard about. We try and tell as many small stories as possible. Make the space feel like it's full of real characters that are going about their day-to-day -day lives. They can give you the true wonder of discovery and often the pride of accomplishing something yourself in a game. It's a wonderful moment. So what is one of your most memorable moments in Skyrim? Finishing the game. Bethesda games are known for their immersion. They have a history of making games where you can immerse yourself, get lost in the open world and do whatever you want and just have fun. But in case of Starfield, the situation is different because every time I tried to do something fun, the game would just throw some random bullshit at me that would ruin that experience, whether it be bad AI, stupid bugs, bunch of loading screens or some boring quests. The immersion in this game is an illusion. The game creates this illusion where it makes you feel like everything is next gen, next level, top of the line. All of this just works and working as intended. But even if you do something slightly different than what the game expects you to do, the entire illusion breaks. For example, if you go to a populated area and start shooting mindlessly, none of the NPCs would react. Like there is a crazy dude emptying his guns and none of the NPCs are actually shocked or scared or anything. They are just chilling. <laughs> as long as you don't hit an NPC, none of them would actually react. And if you compare this to a really old game like GTA San Andreas, even there shooting in public causes NPCs to get scared. That's a game from PlayStation 2. Or if you just block the path of an NPC, they would just stand there because they have a fixed path and they only follow their fixed path. So they have nothing else to do. 
If you take rest for few hours, nothing changes in the background. All of the NPCs stay exactly where they are. It's like time never passes. If you try to talk to a walking or running NPC, then the camera does a 360 degree flip and gets lost god knows where. The game can't even properly handle moving NPC conversation. And even if you go out, kill everyone and cause a mass genocide, all you will get is a bounty. And after you pay that bounty, everyone will forget that you killed like hundreds of people just a few minutes ago. And you will be their hero again. He was the best guy around. What about the people he murdered? What it's murder? So and it's not like the game does not try. The game also tries to make you feel immersed. For example, there is a quest in the Crimson Fleet questline where you have to go and kill this guy named Austin. You find him in this random spaceship where he has his own crew with him. Now you have few options. Either you could do a space combat and kill him or hail the ship and go inside and figure out a way to keep him safe. But the game also gives you another option where you can actually pursue the captain of the ship into killing Austin. You can manipulate him into thinking that Austin is a bad guy and he will kill him. In my case, they both shot each other at the same time and both of them died, which I thought was really interesting. But this entire serious moment was ruined because of bad NPC expressions. I mean, come on, man, you are about to kill someone. Show me some emotions or something. What are you doing? As I already said before, NPCs in this game are not the best. The NPCs in this game does not know how to show expressions. They could have the most heartbreaking story to tell, but they would say it in such a boring and lackluster way that it would sound like the stupidest story you have ever heard. And on top of that, the game does not even follow its own rules. The game doesn't let you travel space through spaceship because in reality, it would take a huge amount of time. Makes sense. But at the same time, you can completely take off your spacesuit in space and run around. You will not die. Your health will slowly turn yellow, but that's, that's it. I don't think that's realistic. Or when you are wearing a space suit, it's supposed to protect you from outer space environment. But if you walk into toxic gas, it still hurts your lungs. Even when you are wearing a space suit, then what's the point of wearing the space suit if outer gas is still getting inside your lungs? The shops in this game does not even look like shops. I mean, what am I even supposed to buy here? What are they even selling? Why can't shops be like Red Dead Redemption 2 shops? where I can go inside without a loading screen, pick up the actual item that I want and then buy it, or just check the ledger to see what other things they are selling. And all of this is happening without any pause or cuts or anything. It's really immersive. Nowadays, most of the RPGs has this kind of shop system where everything is right in front of you in one screen. Everything is like a list and you have to select whatever you want to buy. I get it, it's much more convenient, but it's not immersive at all. We do have over 50 base weapons and over 700 modifications for those weapons. To survive in the wasteland is to team up and build together. We're allowing your character while playing to rebuild, to build the way you want. And in this one, you can build wherever you want. And you can also then move that to wherever you want. Add crafting and research stations in your outposts to utilize any resources you find or already have. You could take a base basic laser pistol from Fallout and then modify that and turn it into something completely new. The construction and assembly mobile platform. Construct your home of the future. And one of the great things about having a fully dynamic game engine is all of this just works. Mod your weapons to adapt them to your playstyle. Different weapon sights and scopes, larger magazines, a selection of grips and barrels. And it, again, it, it just works. But like, as far as stupid gimmicks goes, Ayush is the best fucking one I have ever seen. It is awesome. Crafting in Starfield is a painful experience. It's really complex and confusing, requires a lot of unnecessary steps, and it's not fun or interactive at all. Let me give you an example. 
Let's say you have a gun and you want to craft a suppressor for it. So the first thing you need to do is go to the crafting station and select the suppressor option. Then you will see there's a bunch of material requirements for that crafting. And it's totally normal. You need materials to craft something. It's a common knowledge. So you go and gather those materials. After gathering those materials, you will see that you still cannot craft. Because now you need this other thing called Muzzle Mod 2. Now you may ask, how am I gonna get that? To get Muzzle Mod 2, you need to go to a research lab. Here you will see multiple categories. Here you need to go to the weaponry section. And here you will find Muzzle Mod 1. But there is no Muzzle Mod 2. Where can I get that? Well, to get Muzzle Mod 2, first you need to unlock Muzzle Mod 1. So how do you unlock it? To unlock it, you need to get more materials. Go to different planets, buy stuff, sell stuff, I don't know, just get the materials. After you have gathered those materials, now you will see that you also need to unlock a skill called Weapon Engineering Level 1. And then you will finally be able to unlock Muzzle Mod 1. So now you have to go to skills to put points in Weapon Engineering. But wait, there's more. First, you need to put 4 skill points in the science section just to unlock weapon engineering skill. And let me tell you, skill points are really hard to earn. You get one skill point each time you level up. And it gets harder to get more points as you level up. But hey, whatever, you put 4 points in science section and one more point in weapon engineering to get it to level 1. Now you can finally unlock muzzle mod 1. You are 50% done. Congratulations! Now you need to unlock Muzzle Mod 2. How are you gonna do that? First, you need to gather more materials for this. Obviously, after you are done gathering, you will see another requirement. Now you need Weapon Engineering 2 to unlock Muzzle Mod 2. Still with me? Okay. Now you need to go back into skills and put another point in Weapon Engineering. But wait, you can't. Because first, you need to craft 5 weapon mods and then you will be able to put another point in this skill. But to craft the weapon mod, I need weapon engineering skill at level 2. So it just creates a loop where I'm stuck. I can't do anything. It's just like that job experience meme where you need experience to get a job. But to get the job, you also need experience. In this situation, the only thing you can do is craft low level unwanted stuff for your low level guns just to complete this challenge. So now you need to gather more unnecessary resources for more unnecessary crafting and waste your time. Just so you can create a suppressor for your actual main gun. You have to do so many unnecessary steps for something so simple and it just gets extremely annoying. If you are a hardcore player then it's probably not that big deal for you. But for an average player it's so annoying and confusing that they would just totally avoid crafting at all. And it's a shame cause crafting can also be fun if done right. It can be used to upgrade your armors, your weapons, but because it's so confusing and requires so many steps, in the end it just doesn't feel worth it. Another highlight of Starfield is spaceship building, where the game gives you all the tools you need to make your dream ship. But the thing about Starfield shipbuilding is that it's really complex and kinda confusing, and it will take you some time to understand what's even going on. I myself had to see some YouTube tutorials just to understand what does what. Because at first it was really confusing and I had no idea what I was doing. I just kept getting so many errors. Like why are there so many errors? What's going on? But don't worry, it's not rocket science. No pun intended. As long as your ship has all the necessary requirements like engine, power, grav drive, cockpit and all that stuff, you can literally make whatever the fuck you want. Trust me, I have seen people make all sorts of creative stuff. Imagination is your limit. And also money, I mean seriously, a lot of the shipbuilding stuff in this game is really expensive. Overall, I would say it's extremely complicated and really hard to get into, but once everything clicks, Shipbuilding gets really fun. I mean you could spend hours building one ship. Shipbuilding is one of those things in Starfield that I really liked and I feel like has a lot of potential. Outpost building is also an optional thing you can do in Starfield. And here again you might need to see some tutorials to understand everything. I myself didn't like building outpost. I find building outpost kinda boring. All I did in outpost building is put a sofa in the middle of nowhere and just sit there, thinking about my life decisions. But if you are into outpost building, you can do that too.
Starfield in itself is not a bad game. I mean of course it's not an amazing game either, it has its problems, but it also has some potential too. Even in my Starfield gameplay video which I made a few months ago, I said that this game has potential. The problem of Starfield is not just the game itself but also the hype and fake promises surrounding it. Let me give you an example. Let's say Hollow Knight, which is an amazing 2D metroidvania game. People love this game, it has really good rating, and everybody's desperately waiting for its sequel. Come on Team Cherry, do something! Give us some updates! Anyway, now let's suppose when the game was initially released, it was not promoted as a 2D metroidvania game, but as a 3D hyper-realistic looking AAA title. And when the game will release, it will be the same 2D Hollow Knight. Would people still love it? No, definitely not. I mean, some people might love it, but most of the people would be extremely disappointed because they were promised something and they received something totally different. But does that mean the game is bad now? No, definitely not. It's the same Hollow Knight, but the game will be ruined because of the fake hype and promises. The same thing is happening with Starfield. It is a really bad example, but I hope you get my point. Let me give you a better example. Let's just forget for a moment that Starfield was made by Bethesda. Let's say it was made by some random indie company. And also, there are no gameplay trailers or presentations or interviews to hype up the game. Just one or two trailers to promote the game. And that's it. And then, the game finally releases at a cheaper indie game price. And the review starts dropping. Now because it is the same exact game, so it will also get the same exact review scores. Right? Right? Now you buy this game at a cheaper price. You have no expectations, there was no hype or fake promises. You go in blindly and play the game. Will you still hate it as much as you do it now? Chances are, no. Because now you will be seeing the game from a different perspective. Because it is made by an indie company and it is their first game, your expectations will be low. There will be bugs in the game, there will be some optimization problems, but you will accept all of that because the game is really ambitious and the indie developer team tried to do something really interesting. So you will appreciate their work. When you change the perspective and think that this game was made by an indie company and it's their first game and there will be bugs and the, all those things and your expectation is low, playing this game would feel really good. But that's the thing, Starfield is not made by an indie company. It's made by Bethesda, which is a triple A company. And it's not even their first game either. They have made a lot of other triple A games before this and on top of all this, they hyped this game to the moon. And that's why the reality was very different from everyone's actual expectation. I heard a lot of people say that it's Bethesda games, this is the kind of games they make, or there will be some bugs because it's Bethesda. But why is that? Why treat Bethesda differently? They are also a AAA company, they've been making games for years, they're also charging the same amount. Then why treat them differently? You know, I really wanted to love this game. I was really skeptical at first, but after watching those trailers and interviews, I really hoped that this would be the next big thing, that this would be Bethesda's new Skyrim. But sadly, it is not. Or at least not yet. By the time I am making this video, Bethesda has already started updating Starfield with patches and new features. They finally added DLSS and a lot of quality of life features to this game. They are slowly improving the game to make it better. And one day, Starfield might actually be a really amazing game and live up to the expectations that the studio created. But I wish they did all of that before the game actually released. Mark my word. Even though Fallout 76 was a disaster and Starfield was kinda disappointing, in future when Todd will get on that stage again to promote Elder Scrolls 6 by saying something like 69 times more details or 8 times the rendering technology or whatever, people will again forget about all of Bethesda's past mistakes and they will get hyped and excited again, including me. And this cycle of disappointment will keep continuing. Although I really hope. And seriously, I really, really, really hope that this cycle of disappointment will finally end. I was the kid, I was writing games when I was, you know, 12, whatever, and uh, the other kids in the block would say, you know, I'm gonna play quarterback for the Cowboys, and I'd be like, I'm gonna make video games and everyone's gonna play them. What is special about creating games? I see games as a creator as the ultimate combination of art and technology. It makes it all worthwhile to, to have people say, you know, that's great, I want it, keep going, so. Again, do something great. Make the player proud when he's playing your game. Make yourself proud that you made it. Make your player proud that he bought it. She hugged me and said, this game better be really good. 
<laughs> Thanks. Why do you believe Skyrim was nominated for Game of the Year? I have no idea. You'll have to ask people who nominated I guess. I guess they liked it. This is the golden age of gaming. Great games are played, not made. Great games are played, not made. You have to play your own game a ton. Well, what things in the game are the most fun? Like, what can we do more with? So they want you to shout. They want me to shout? They want you no, to I shout. No, I don't do that. He's never I done that. No. <laughs> I'm going to make video games and everyone's going to play them. You dork. Go back to the chess club. Who's laughing now? <laughs> yes, I was in the chess club.